with Sydney, not that I might, I will start <laughs> with you, Sydney. I'm going to introduce you and tell um, our, our viewers um, a little bit about your past. You were you were in the kitchen at an early age. Um, your dad was a professional chef and um, an inspiration and a personal teacher. That must have been awesome. Uh, time spent in the kitchen with her dad was both educational and fun for Sydney, which would encourage her down her own path to become a chef in 2015. She trained and studied at Conest Conestoga College. Where is that? Ah, uh, sorry. In 2018, after excelling in her role as sous chef, Sydney took on the head chef position at Taco Farm <clears throat> and has navigated confidently through challenging times. Sydney has enjoyed exploring the pathways of Mexican cuisine and her own indigenous culinary traditions. A champion for local grown ingredients, Sydney is an exceptional fit at the Fat Sparrow Group and it's no wonder she has experienced such, such, such success at such a young age. That was a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Nick, Nick Benninger, chef and restaurant, uh, restaurateur Fat Sparrow Group, Kitchener Waterloo. Um, you became a chef at 16, uh, working at a summer camp in Northern Ontario. Uh, fell in love with kitchens and cooking, and since then has rooted his career in many of the philosophies and lear he learned in that first encounter with food service. After attending George Brown College, Nick completed his apprenticeship working in kitchens throughout Ontario and finally settling down in, the home in his hometown of Kitchener. In 2008, Nick opened Uptown 21 with his wife, Natalie, and in 2013, the couple went on to open Taco Farm. Uptown 21 has been included in Where to Eat Canada every year since it opened. And recently, Taco Farm was featured on the television show, You've Got to Eat Here. Um, now, it goes on and on. I, I would say your bio um, is quite extensive. Um, but um, here you are now at Fats at um, Taco Farm, and you guys are going to give us a rundown on some Mexican inspired cuisine using indigenous ingredients. Yeah, sort of. Um, we're we're <laughs> today we're using some indigenous ingredients and some indigenous techniques, and uh, we're going to nixtamalize some corn, turn it into masa, essentially. Um, and uh, we're keeping things very, very simple today. I think the total ingredients we're using is about five or six, so half of them are probably indigenous, but it's not. I would say it's also a very familiar group of foods for folks, so it's nothing too outside of uh, what everybody's comfortable with or, or already knows about for sure. So. Well, I'm going to let you take up most of the screen and talk us through um, the process and tell us what is and what is it and why and when and all that. I will monitor the chat. So audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll watch through that. And I'm going to take myself off camera now so you have more screen. Thanks a lot, Renee. Um, thanks for that introduction. So yeah, we, my name is Nick. Um, this is Sydney. Sydney is our chef at Taco Farm. Uh, she does all the work. She wears this jacket on a regular basis. I pull my jacket out for uh, special occasions. <laughs> as the company has grown, I find myself less and less in the kitchens um, as these things go. And I find myself more and more on the side of, uh, of working with our team and, and helping them along and, and facilitating their uh, growth and learning paths and all that kind of lovely stuff. And uh, I think with Sydney and, and what we've been able to do a taco farm is particularly special and fun um, for several reasons. For one, Sydney was very young when she came to work for us. Uh, when did you, how old were you when you started? Like 19? 19. 19. Yeah. So 19 years old when she started with us. And through that sort of um, concept of battlefield promotions, uh, she made herself up to sous chef and then chef very quickly. I think 
you were 21 when we promoted you to head chef, uh, which was just at the start of the pandemic, or I shouldn't say the start of the pandemic, it was about six or eight months before. Um, but the bulk of her time being our head chef has been throughout this pandemic, which is so wild and interesting to think about it in those terms. Um, we're going to have to go back and, and reteach people how to how to restaurant again when we get back to fully normal. Um, but from a culinary point of view, uh, it's it's just been awesome. And, and for us at Taco Farm, um, the pandemic in a lot of ways gave us a chance to sort of pause and reflect on what Taco Farm was. And, and we've certainly, I think, in the time since uh, March 2020, elevated the cuisine deliberately because we could, because we stopped being a place that um, folks just lined up for for fish tacos. And we were able to spend a little more time on the plate, which was interesting because most restaurants were sort of heading in the opposite direction where we saw fine dining establishments uh, flipping into hamburger joints. Um, at Taco Farm, we kind of did the opposite, which was think, you know what, if we're going to have a reduced amount of seats going forward, then we should really consider what we're putting forward. And, uh, and we did that. And um, the way that that has sort of crossed over with Sydney's Indigenous roots uh, was this beautiful sort of relationship that we never really saw coming. Um, I certainly didn't. I did not envision us being able to tap into Sydney's culture and, and her other passions in life through Taco Farm. Um, but, but we have had that opportunity. So um, it's been super lovely. It's been a great experience for me I, as, as a white uh, man who sort of established in his culinary career. It's been a great opportunity for me to perhaps help shine a light on somebody else's career and somebody else's culture. Um, and as a Canadian who's constantly looking for ways to be a better ally, uh, Sydney's been an awesome resource for me because I've been able to ask some really dumb questions uh, in an environment that's, uh, you know, just, just supportive and great. So it helps me find better pathways to be um, just a better person and a better part of the community. And, and in the same motion, we're giving Sydney this chance to teach us some stuff and to explore her own roots. And it's really opened us up to some great opportunities, including being here with you folks today. Um, I think it's that confluence of, of opportunities and cultures and pathways that make this, ex this experience of making tortillas from corn special. Otherwise, this is a fairly routine operation. Um, and we're really not gonna do anything today that you probably haven't seen before. Um, but I think it's just the context of which we're doing it that makes it special for me. Um, and I hope for Sydney too. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we should get into it. Yeah, so <laughs> before we get into it, into it, um, I will say, so what we're doing is nixtamalizing the corn uh, to make tortillas. So folks, probably most of us all know what that means. Um, corn, and when we talk about corn in this case, we're not talking about sweet corn, we're talking about uh, field corn. Um, corn is a fairly nutrient void, not very good for you ingredient, although it's a very bountiful crop and grows extremely well in most environments. Uh, the process is nixtamalization, converts those grains and turns them into something healthy. And we'll kind of talk about that as we go through it. Um, but it also changes the flavor and the texture and all kinds of things about it and takes it from being uh, this just benign grain to something truly special with a wonderful flavor. Um, we are using corn um, that we have gathered through one of our relationships with a local producer, uh, Wish to Walk to Winnewalk. With sock to win a walk. With sock to win a walk. I'm getting there. So that'll be a common occurrence throughout the course of the evening. There'll be plenty of words that I butcher. Um, and Sydney will come to the rescue and try and give a slightly better version of that pronunciation, although I don't think she's always perfect either. Um, but we have these beautiful corns that we'll be using from those folks uh, that they grow locally. So wish, wish sock to win a walk, that was pretty good, is a local group that um, is part of the White Owl Ancestry. 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 That That's a word I should have known. <laughs> um, group that, that has several sort of um, legs and organizations within it. And all of their goals are sort of to deepen the relationship with the Indigenous community and support that Indigenous community here in the Waterloo region. Um, and uh, in specifically in connection to this is the Wissock to Winnewak group, which is a farm group that has 
uh, firm space on several properties within the region and, and as far away as Guelph, uh, where they get some, some bits and pieces of some gardens that they're able to work with. And they have a staff there, this incredible group of, of people who are doing amazing things. And then an even better group of volunteers that are helping them. Uh, and they're growing uh, some heritage variety things and some, some indigenous ingredients and trying to bring those back and uh, make them accessible to their community. And then of course, as a byproduct of that, they become accessible to us and the greater community. Um, so we had this wonderful opportunity to work with those horns. Um, and so we'll get into step one of the process of, of mixtamalization and the whole cooking process. And we're just gonna kind of talk about that relationship throughout the whole thing. So we'll, we'll kind of travel back and forth. This won't be a very linear timeline. Um, we'll jump back and forth a little bit because we also wanna be able to cook the process through while we go. So um, step one of this process is to sort through your corn. So uh, just like any grain, beans, uh, even rice in some situations, some cases, uh, the first thing we want to do is sort of sort through it. Uh, so I'll just put this over here in front of Sid. Um, but basically what we're looking out for is just any stones or rocks, stones or rocks, stones, wood chips, anything like that, that we don't want to end up in the final product. Um, when we're dealing like, again, with grains that come from smaller producers, this is always a good thing to do um, because you'd be surprised what you find in, in these things. So step one is to do that. If you're getting your corn or your beans or what have you from a larger producer, probably not as necessary, um, but we definitely take that step here, um, especially in the restaurant environment because we've got a certain responsibility uh, to keep folks safe and keep their teeth intact. Uh, so Sid's just gonna go through that. While she's going through that, I'll show you the other um, variety of corn that we won't be working with today, but it's beautiful. Sorry, my hip fans are a little low. I'm a little tall. Um, we have this, actually, you won't be able to see it. We have this other uh, variety of corn, uh, which is just this beautiful uh, blue corn or purple corn. Um, we have used this before as well for some events, and it works fantastically. It comes out to this beautiful sort of indigo color. Uh, but for today, we wanted to show you guys the white corn because of the transformation that it goes through is a little more visual, visually obvious. Um, so Sid's just kind of sorting through the corn here, uh, looking for, for, for any, uh, any kind of things that we don't want in there. So she's pretty much done that now and uh, we can move on to the next step. So the next step will be to just add this corn to some water. So we've got a pot here. It's very important that you use a non-reactive pot. Um, so basically not aluminum. Uh, most other things are fairly non-reactive and we can work with. So we're just gonna go ahead and add all that corn into that water. Um, the water is not boiling, it's just sort of warm water at this point. Um, so we'll go ahead and get that corn in there. Now, the more common way to do this, especially locally, uh, is to use pickling lime or, or cal uh, or slaked lime uh, to nixtamalize this corn. What we want to do is turn this water into a highly uh, alkaline rich uh, water environment. And so, like I said, cow or pickling lime um, is the typical way to do it. And it's certainly the way that we were doing it at Taco Farm um, when we were playing around with this corn in the first place. And this can be purchased at your local Latin market. Um, it is a caustic ingredient. So it's actually quite, you don't want to let this sit on your skin for too long. And you certainly don't want to breathe it in. Um, so this might be a good opportunity to actually put your mask on when you're in your kitchen at home. Um, but it is relatively safe to work with. You just don't want it to be on your body for very long. And once it gets into the water and starts working with the corn, it actually neutralizes itself and becomes less harmful. Um, so there's not a whole lot to worry about. But if you do buy that stuff, it it's, gets more airborne than cornstarch. So you do want to be kind of gentle with it as you go. Um, but we aren't actually using that today. We're going to be using ash, wood ash. Um, so one of the beautiful things uh, that came through these relationships that we've been building is um, we spent a day on the farm with Dave and, and uh, Elizabeth and all the folks down there who, and Chelsea who, who grew the corn and worked with us on these projects that we've been doing. Um, we spent a day doing the nixtamalization process right on the farm with them with a nice fire pit outside, had an incredible day together, although it was pouring rain sideways. Um, we still managed to have just this beautiful day together, sort of spending time breaking bread, all that jazz. And they introduced us to the concept of 
of using wood ash instead of uh, the lime and explain to us that this was actually sort of the the older world traditional way to do it um, by using wood ash or burnt seashells uh, to, to achieve that alkaline rich water. So um, we did that with them and with the corn we're actually, we, we had to do the like magic of television thing because this will take hours. Um, the corn that we're using to show you guys the second steps or the third steps, whatever, is done in the ash that we got from their farm and in a lovely sort of full circle uh, world the ash that they've created is from their woodlots for their uh, sugar bush. And so it's all maple trees that have been felled um, and they created that ash with that. And, and that is actually the maple syrup that we're gonna be enjoying later um, is how that all came to be when Dave suggested we try with maple syrup. And, and uh, we just, as chefs, and we love the romance of cooking and all of these things, we love the concept of cooking with the wood ash and later eating the maple syrup from that very same sugar bush. Um, we weren't able to get enough wood ash from them uh, to do the second recipe. So it, I, we were actually talking about this yesterday that when we realized we kind of had to have two versions of the recipe ready to go, um, that we didn't have enough wood ash. And here you have a couple of chefs in the city uh, who were like, where on earth are we going to get wood ash from? So I phoned up my good friends at the Lancaster Smokehouse, who are a Feastland certified uh, restaurant, as well as us at Taco Farm, and is a big reason why we're here today through Feastland. Um, and they, of course, smoke every single day of their operations. They have this beautiful smoker. Um, and so they were provided us with the ash today. So I showed up at uh, the length this morning where I usually go to get pigtails and I got two liters of ash labeled Nick's ashes, which I found morbidly hilarious. Um, and I now have a good ash source and I just loved, Chef actually didn't ask me until I showed up at the restaurant what I was using it for. And I was quite happy he did because I thought it would have been really weird if he didn't ask me. Um, Chef, so. I have a few questions already. Um, one was what kind of wood is the, are you using? So, so the wood that we used the first time was maple wood. Um, this wood is actually a blend of hardwoods. So there is some mesquite in here. There's some apple, there's some walnut. Uh, it's, it's a blend of some hardwoods that they use at the link. They wouldn't tell me the exact formula uh, because it's according to them, they're proprietary uh, wood blends that they didn't want to be too forthcoming with. And their barbecue is fantastic. So I suppose there is room for secrets. Um, the reading that we've done and the, the conversations we've had with our friends at the farm, they actually traditionally would have been um, a mixture of plant ashes and, and tree ashes, wood ashes. And they were actually using plants that grew in these sodium rich environments that would be high in alkalinity um, that would translate to an alkaline high ash. So uh, we are just using wood. There's no plant ash in this. The results have worked so far wonderfully. It does the conversion, it washes the kernel as it should. So it's, it's working wonderfully for us. Um, but we continue to sort of read about these, these recipes and using wood ash and how it varied from all the different sort of um, indigenous areas up and down, uh, like from, from Central America up into sort of the New Mexico and, and Southern Americas. Um, it could be different all over there. So this is a blend of hardwoods. What we used on the farm for the product we're actually gonna be grinding today was straight maple um, from their sugar brush. So uh, yeah, more, more to come on that as we go. I don't know what plants are high in alkalinity yet, but we are gonna keep learning this stuff because just we're just- Just a few more, few more questions. Um, yeah. I have wondering, like how long are you cooking that corn for? And then at some point, um, Sydney, we'd love to hear a little more about yourself. You know, what, uh, which First Nations group or reserve are you from? And if you want to talk about that, um, but tell me how long are we cooking the corn for? How long does one have to cook it for? So it depends on who you're uh, asking. I mean, uh, depending on the region and who you're talking to, it can vary. Um, so we actually have research that we, you know, just cook it enough to soften uh, just slightly and then soak overnight. Um, but when we were at the farm, uh, at South Twinnawak, they actually cooked it all the way through. So the times vary depending on like the kernel and that sort of, uh, sort of thing. But um, yeah, just basically enough to soften it. So the one that we're going to be doing today has cooked for about an hour and has been sitting for about another hour. Uh, we've done it in with the cow where we cooked it for just about 10 or 15 minutes and then turned it off and let it soak overnight. Um, 
you're kind of treating the corn like you do chickpeas for making falafel. Uh, you're not really cooking the, the corn, you're just softening it enough that you'll be able to grind it. Um, but we did actually find there were fairly dramatic differences between when we cooked it through on the farm. Uh, so like, like, like for about an hour, an hour plus, and then basically washed it almost immediately. It was very creamy, very supple dough. Um, and then the doughs that we cooked more briefly and soaked overnight had a more granular dough. And honestly, they both had their virtues. The granular one had a nice texture, um, had sort of more individual spots of flavor, whereas the creamier one has this just homogenized, beautiful richness to it. And the, and the texture was really lovely, really fluffy and nice. Um, and then I'll hand it back over to Sid to talk more about her uh, personal background. And, and in the meantime, I am going to add the ashes into the water now. So we've turned the water on and I'm going to add the ashes. The ratio is about one to 1 1.5. So for every cup of corn, we want to do about a cup and a half of the ash. So I'm going to dump that in. I'll get stirring it and I'll let Sid talk a bit about herself. Yeah. So um, one thing I like to say when we're talking about you know, where we are from as Indigenous people is um, not every person is going to be the same. A lot of people, um, you know, don't really know where they come from as like records were lost. And, you know, a lot of children during residential school times were adopted into families where they wouldn't know their background. So as for my case and my family, um, it's something that we don't really know um, exactly what tribe or that kind of stuff. We grew up um, grew up off reservation and that's just something that uh, was unfortunately very common to just say no I'm not indigenous um, during that time and, and as a way to protect your family so throughout my family it was more of no we're not indigenous we're going to be we're French and that was self-preservation technically so um, as for myself we don't know but it's um something that I didn't necessarily grow up with you know we went to like smaller events we knew we were indigenous but um you know we didn't have you know paper and something that I think is unfortunate is just using blood quantum to define who you are and if you are indigenous um so that's just something you know we don't have you know a paper saying this is where we're from uh, but something that you know we're just learning to explore in a more general sense How are you doing over here? Pretty good. I forgot one important step, you guys, and, and we did this on the farm as well. Um, we didn't sift our ashes. So uh, currently there are some wood chips in there. They will work their way out of the process. We did this exact same thing on the farm. Um, one of the actual benefits of forgetting to sift your ashes before putting them in there um, is that we will actually see some really beautiful color contrasts. Um, and I'll actually just move this camera a little closer now. Um, so you guys can see a little better. Um, can you unplug that? So no, this here. Thanks. Um, but just to keep an eye on this um, corn as it starts to uh, transform, and I've turned my overhead light on, so don't look at how shiny my forehead is now. Um, but you'll see now. So this corn went in white, um, much like it is here, of course. Uh, so it's still fairly white, but we're starting to see already some beautiful orange pop out. So instantly the alkalinity in the water is starting to convert um, this this corn into something that it certainly wasn't before and something quite magical um, and the beauty of me forgetting to sift this corn and us having those black wood chips in there those bits of charcoal is that it gives you that wonderful contrasting color and it, it did make for some beautiful photographs uh, when we spent the day on the farm it did also mean there was some work to be had when we washed the grain. So we're, we're going to have to wash it quite thoroughly later anyways to get the ash off and to, to scrub off the casing and the, the shell. Um, but if, if and when you do this at home, if, uh, do sift it before you do that. And luckily I did for the batch I did earlier. Um, so we won't have to go through that process with you folks today. Um, but yeah, don't make the mistake I just did. Um, and do remember to sift it. This, uh, luckily, these ashes have, that came from the Lake Aster Smokehouse are 100% just wood burnt. There's no, uh, there's nothing impure about these. Um, so any of these chunks are just unburned bits of wood. Um, but of course, I do feel silly for forgetting to do that. Uh, but that's the way that it goes. And I, I have this overwhelming abundance of being able to feel silly because I practice it quite often. So hopefully you guys 
can see this. I'm sure you can um, on my screen. Yeah, you can even pick it right up. Um, but this corn has gone from, like I said, that sort of pale white to this beautiful um, orange already. And it's got this jack-o'-lantern white look to it. Um, you can see the difference between the two colors. It's kind of washed out on our camera here, but um, it's instantly sort of transforming and developing this beautiful color. This color will subside a little bit over the cooking process. So um, once it's here, it's got this wonderful orange to it. It will sort of fade back to a bit of a yellow in, in due time. Um, but at the moment, it's got this lovely orange to it. Um, so we are just going to reduce this heat down. You don't want to be rolling this as a boil. You just want to be simmering it. Um, so we're going to turn that heat down quite a lot just to get down to a simmer, no matter which method you're doing, whether you're cooking it through and letting it soak very briefly or cooking it um, briefly and then letting it soak for a long period of time. You never really want to be hard boiling it. You just want to get it up to, to that sort of at simmer level and then just let it go from there. So um, we're going to do that. If, if we were doing this in real time, we would let this go for about an hour. Um, until it's quite tender. So you'll notice that when I pick a grain up, it's, it's still quite hard, although I am starting to be able to peel away the, um, the skin of the corn, um, but it's obviously not there yet. And if we go over to this corn uh, over here, that sitting that I cooked earlier, uh, I'm able to sort of squish it. And it's like, a, it's like a, almost like a perfectly cooked arborio rice. So that rice where it's got some raw grain left in the middle, that al dente, um, but the outside is sort of creamy and uh, starchy and ready to be eaten. So um, that's where we're at right now. We're going to let this corn um, just kind of sit and hang out. That chemical reaction is happening. We're converting this over to a very healthy grain. Um, one of the things that are interesting about this whole process, this process dates back to uh, they don't quite know how long, but the earliest evidence they found of it being done was in Guatemala um, in around 1500 BC, so almost 4,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago. Um, and this was discovered, of course, by the explorers and by Christopher Columbus, who came over and they brought this back to Europe and to Africa and to India, where corn became a very important crop. Um, the interesting thing that they didn't bring back with them was this process of nixtamalization. So when they came over here, they witnessed cultures who were relying on corn as their main crop um, and corn combined with beans was giving them whole proteins. And so even in months where meats and, and real normal proteins or more common proteins weren't available, they were able to rely on the nixtamalized corn and beans to create this healthy diet and these whole proteins. When the corn was brought over to Europe, uh, they didn't bring that same wisdom back with them, uh, which of course is repeated throughout history. Um, and there was many, many instances of disease where cultures then leaned on these crops very heavily because corn is such a great crop, uh, grows so easily and in such abundance. Um, there were cultures that were relying on it quite solely. And unfortunately it led to a lot of uh, diseases and issues, dietary issues that, that led to further problems. So. Um, a really great example of of that I, I don't know that ingenuity how how they came to discover um that this was happening some of the thoughts and rumors are that um they would take heated limestone so limestone heated up in the fire um to cook their foods because of course they didn't have pots that could go over fire um so they would take limestone heated up in the fire to cook foods and the limestone would create an alkaline enough environment that it would actually create this conversion. And I suppose over time, they realized that not only did it taste better, um, but it became a healthier product for them to be eating. And, and like I said, in combination with the beans creates that whole protein. So um, I hope you guys can see this pretty good. Maybe I'll put a little bit on this plate here. Um, but this just has this incredible yellow orange. It actually looks like that terrible Halloween candy, um, caramel corn, which I know some people like, but it's terrible. Uh, so yeah, that's where we're at so far. Um, this is this is getting fairly close to where we could stop it if we were going to soak it overnight. Um, we're, we, of course, keep cooking. So. Yeah. And I think that uh, what's really important about this nixtamalization process is not only it makes it healthier, but also just easier to digest in general. Yeah, and work with. It actually takes the corn. So, so if we were to 
grind corn that hasn't been nixtamalized, we of course end up with cornmeal. Um, if you were to try and take cornmeal or even finer corn flour and add water to it like you do with uh, masa harina, which is the dry version of this preparation that we're doing, it doesn't bind into a dough. It just is a crumbly mess all the time. And of course, you can make other wonderful things with that, but you cannot turn it into a dough. The, uh, the process of nixtamalization converts this over to something that develops a bit of a, a gluten-like element to it and becomes something that we can turn into a dough, which of course is how we make tortillas and tamales and all of those lovely things, so. Can you make, um, oh, I just lost the name. So with that corn, can you make, um, <laughs> I can't believe I, I just lost it. I, I pinned myself too far. You know, what's that sort of porridge consistency of corn? Grits. Grits, thank you. Uh, so, so yeah, polenta will actually be made from cornmeal, whereas grits are made from hominy. Um, and, and hominy is exactly what we're left with here. So, so this corn here um, is corn that we've put through the nixtamalization process and then dehydrated once again. Um, so, so that is exactly what you would make uh, grits with um, or that, that corn porridge that, you, that you're referring to. Um, and again, it has lovely health benefits to it and it's a, it's a healthy item to be eating. Uh, whereas corn meal that we make polenta with um, does not have the same properties. Although I love cornmeal and I make it quite often, um, but it hasn't been through that nixtamalization process. So that's an example of really similar products and the end results are quite similar. But if you've ever had grits, they have that tanginess, that sourness, that richness, and that's exactly the flavor we're developing here by the, this process that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something that we would use this uh, in indigenous culture would be things like corn soup um, and just any sort of like soup things that would carry easily be really uh, hearty in the winter um, and something that still enjoyed today often. Awesome. So what we're going to do now is sort of do that uh, Emerald Lagasse through the magic of television thing. Um, I'm going to put this corn on a back burner so that I can enjoy it later. I don't want to stop this cooking process. So I will um, put this over here. And then we are going to actually show you what the product looked like after um, that hour in cooking. Um, so that is over here. So once again, I'll maybe turn on this terrible overhead light. Um, that makes, maybe that's better. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, so this is corn that now has been sitting in the ashes still. We wanted to kind of show you guys um, what it looks like, like uh, cooked. So this ash, we, of course, as we continue to hydrate the ash, essentially, and of course, reduce our water through the process, um, we end up with something that literally looks like mud. Uh, and, and it is, frankly, mud. In fact, this can be used, uh, this byproduct can actually be used to create almost like a paper mache type of the product um, if we were to lay it out and dry it, which we're not going to do. My kids are a little too old for that. But um, this is where we are right now. So we've got these kernels that are, like I said earlier, they're kind of cooked. They're soft enough for me to squish with my finger, but they do still have a lot of toothness to, to them and texture. Um, and they're just sitting in this ash. So now we have the important process of washing it. Um, washing it in this case has two meanings, of course. Um, the first part of that process will be literally just washing the ash off of this. And then the second part of this process will be rubbing it under some water um, to actually wash and to finish off the process of dissolving that shell. So a lot of the shell is actually breaking down and dissolving into the water as it cooks. Um, but there will be a little more shell that we'll have to sort of work off with our hands. And uh, part of that kernel, part of the, the germ of the kernel will actually come off during that process too. So the first thing we'll do is uh, wash off that initial bit of ash. I think this obviously probably goes without saying, um, but we definitely don't want this going down our drains. Um, my wife definitely doesn't want this going down our drains. Um, so we would normally actually, I would do this outside and this is what we've done in the past is do this outside where you can hose it off over the lawn. Um, this actually is wonderful for the garden and in moderation. Um, but here today, because I don't want to run outside on you folks, 
I'm just putting it into a um, strainer with a large hole underneath, and then I'll be able to discard that water later. Um, the same is to be said for the cow or the pickling line. If you're working with that and you're doing it in your terrain, you just want to work with a lot of water. Don't We don't want that water sitting for very long in our pipes because it is caustic and it can sort of eat away at the pipes. Um, and restaurant tours have enough bills to pay without paying for additional plumbing work to be done. So you do want to be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, but with this one, it's more painfully obvious because it's just mud that we don't want in our garden. So, uh, or in our, in our drains. So I'm going to turn around and give this an initial rinse just to get this wood ash off. Um, and Sid's going to regale you with stories. <laughs> so while we have a moment, does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. I think that's no. There, there aren't any, um, questions right now, but. I did want to, um, um, I, I would love you to speak a little more about, um, you know, your, your, the, the indigenous, um, path that, that was taken. I mean, what we've learned, um, recently was that, um, you know, there is no, well, a lot of the people don't know exactly where they come from, as you were referring to, yeah. because of displacements and that the reserves that they're on are just because that's where they were put. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that reservation is where their roots were. Can you talk a bit about that? So yeah, it's um, something that is very different and personal to each person. Um, but in, you know, my experience, it's not something we grew up with, like something that, you know, an experience that you would have on reserve, but, um, you know, something that Indigenous people are really trying to do right now is focus on, um, you know, trying to bring back our roots, because some people don't really realize that um, this is recent, very recent trauma. So the last um, residential school actually closed in 1997, and that was actually the year I was born. So 24 years ago, um, and for a time in Canada, practicing our culture was illegal in many senses. Um, and, and, you know, families were broken apart and big part of most Indigenous people's history is passed by word of mouth, passed by song and stories and, um, you know, grandmothers uh, passing that on to children and all those beautiful traditions, right? So, um, you know, when families are broken apart, when you're taken to a place that you might not really, you know, be familiar with, when you're not allowed to speak your language, when you're not allowed to practice your song or dance, um, it's something that really broke um, kind of the system. And something that I like to say is, you know, I think Indigenous people were really uh, robbed of a chance of having, you know, a really rich cuisine, like, you know, Mexican uh, cuisine has really stood through time. Um, so, yeah, I think it's uh, really different depending on where you are. There was obviously uh, countless numbers of tribes throughout Canada. Um, and yeah, so one thing that we're just trying to do right now is you know, not really find a sense of like what tribe, like when you see in Mexico, like different cities have different, um, you know, cuisines that are slightly different. Uh, it's just something that uh, overall, we're just trying to look at um, finding our roots and finding people who can speak the language and uh, bringing that back to the younger generations. I, I would even add to that, and that's what that's what I do is I always add to things, but uh, <laughs> you must add <the> things. <laughs> that, that in some ways, indigenous culture and things are still illegal. Like as we explore the opportunities that we may have to broaden Sydney's culinary impact locally and what she can do through her culture, there are ingredients that she still can't, can't buy and sell in a restaurant setting. And, and there, those that's common across all of Canada. Um, and it's quite ridiculous and hopefully those things start to change but a lot of these injustices and, and racial practices are still there and they're still limiting growth and expression and, and all of us are being robbed of it um, but particularly Sydney and, and her community um, and it's it's quite shameful actually and and there's actually like a, a fairly good example of um, of that even throughout the relationships we've we've had here one of the first interactions we had with with Sauk to Winnewak was 
uh, I nailed it that time. I said that it almost for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they brought to us corn smut or hoops. Wheat la coche. Wheat la coche, um, uh, which is, of course, a fungus that attacks uh, the corn, um, which was, uh, it currently grows all over North America, and I'm sure everywhere else corn is grown. Through farming practices, they've tried to eradicate that fungus from happening in corn, um, primarily, of course, in sweet corns and commodity corns. Um, and I've actually, as a chef, you know, a decade ago or more, reached out to local corn farmers and got some de la coche um and it really had no flavor and really didn't taste like much at all um and i was kind of disappointed through that experience but then uh wish shot to win brought us some corn smut uh from their fields where they were growing these uh heritage breeds of corn and we found the flavor on that corn smut to be re remarkably more pronounced and pungent and strong the way it should have been but the really interesting thing was that um this product was brought to us at the restaurant and something that at one point, certainly Sydney's ancestors would have worked with and dealt with. And Sydney had never heard of it and never dealt with it before. Um, I had some familiarity, but even more luckily, we had Chef Hilda, who is our sous chef at Taco Farm, uh, who hails from Mexico City, uh, who of course had this deep familiarity with it. And, and she was able to sort of teach Sydney and I what she knows about that product and how they cook it. And then we were able to take our chef sensibilities and our cooking approaches kind of blend those things together magically. And, and that's actually the origin of, of Sydney getting these opportunities to explore culture through Taco Farm. Um, but again, it's like the fact that these ingredients that would have been so important to the culture have really been wiped off of their, their, their lore. They, they don't, we, we don't know about these things. Um, and it's a real shame. And that's through generational just cleansing it and racism and all those things so it to say that it's it's fresh is it's still present it's still happening today um and those types of things need to change and those are the types of things that we look forward to continuing to find ways to advocate for and and maybe make positive change for um but for now we deal with corn and the ingredients we do have access to so by understanding these stories by hearing these stories and learning about them as you said nick i mean we all benefit you know, which is um, is at least a start. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I selfishly think I'm benefiting more from this than anybody because I'm given these opportunities to see things that I never would have had access to and to have someone like Sydney and, and her friends and her community embrace me and, and help me learn more in an environment where, again, I feel comfortable well, asking really stupid questions because I'm full of them. Um, so without further ado, we'll move on to washing the corn. Um, so you can see here that we've given it a significant rinse. We've gotten rid of most of that ash. Um, the, the relationship that happens in the pan actually develops a bit of a, a flavor that's not overly desirable. So we do want to make sure not only to get rid of the texture of the ash, we want to rinse away the flavor that's sort of in that water. Um, and it's been pulled out of the corn. So we've given that a good rinse in the sink over there and now it's just sitting here soaking in some uh, fresh water. And what Sydney's gonna start to do is actually just in, in small batches, you can kind of put it between your hands and give it a wash um, or a scrub between your hands. And this process of scrubbing it will start to peel off bits of germ um, and bits of skin. And you can, it'll be really impossible for you guys to see this through these cameras. Um, but it does instantly happen and it sort of dissolves on your hand. Um, so this isn't something that you have to peel and discard the peels. If you're doing this and I, if I weren't doing this on the TV screen right now or the computer screen, we would just be doing it in the sink it, with this strainer, um, not inside the bowl, just with some running water on it. And I would be uh, just, and I'm going to in a second, and I'm going to leave Sydney solo on the camera for another moment. Um, and I'm just going to quickly run this under running water scrub my hands back and forth and fairly quickly that'll get rid of what remains on the corn kernels because a lot of it is already dissolved into the water um, but there is some remaining that's sort of stubborn um, so i'm going to turn around and do that while sydney's going to tell jokes uh again so this will only take me one moment and i'll be right back and uh sid so i can yeah you can leave you a bit if you want. That's okay. Uh, so one thing I wanted to just mention about this corn. So this is actually a Haudenosaunee um, white corn. So this is something that um, the people at Wasak to um, you know, had some of these kernels and throughout the years that they have been doing this, they have 
um, you know, taken kind of the best of the crop and, you know, worked with to, um, you know, just try and perfect kind of what they were doing. So this corn has come out to be super flavorful and just really exciting for them. And I think it's, um, you know, exciting for us to be able to use this because, you know, often you see these types of heritage corn, um, but only, you know, at Thanksgiving or around Halloween and it's just used for decoration. And um, so now that, you know, we have these types of corn, we can use it and uh, eat it and make all sorts of really delicious things with it. And so when we're peeling this also, um, just back to like what Nick is calling as like the shell, kind of think of like when you have like a can of chickpeas and there's almost like a, a thin skin around the chickpea and that's what we're looking to remove and that's so it's partially been dissolved. Okay, so we're just rinsing our corn here. And this final product is what we're eventually gonna take to our grinder to make our masa. I have a question. <laughs> yeah. I have a quick question, Sydney. So the corn that you say, you know, is used for dec decorative or has been used, but is that the, 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 the dried cord on the cob that we often see, you know, bound together, all that really bright, colorful stuff. Is that the same that you're using? Yeah, so it's similar. Obviously it's not um, colored, but the same idea that, uh, yeah, it's uh, a traditional corn that you wouldn't be able to just eat by yourself. So a lot of people, you know, just say, yeah, we can't eat it, it's an edible, um, but it's something that we've been eating for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, on the note of being a good ally. Um, one thing that uh, we should really steer away from is calling it Indian corn, because um, that's not a term we use anymore. So uh, when we refer to this, you can say indigenous corn or heritage corn. That's all um, great ways to, to be a little bit more sensitive. That's an example of some of the dumb questions I like to ask Sydney. Uh, but it's, it's, and it's lovely to have someone who will answer them for me. Because uh, I find sometimes we're so paralyzed through our own fear of saying the wrong thing that we say nothing. Um, so it is it is lovely and yeah, fairly easy to find someone who will help you. So um, I would encourage anybody that is in the same position uh, that I am in to, to do that and to reach out and start asking some questions. And honestly, I, I hope there's communities like ours with foundations like uh, the Healing of the Seven Generations or White Owl Ancestry and wish sock to Wittawak because they're always looking for uh, volunteers um, of any variety. And there are excellent ways to get involved in those communities and to learn more through that process and, and to feel good about what you're giving back. Um, and certainly it's something that we continue to do at Taco Farm and uh, trying to take some of these more recent uh, horrible discoveries and, and terrible events that we've witnessed or, or learned of and use them as opportunities to talk and explore and raise awareness and, and in some cases raise funds when necessary. So uh, yeah, so our corn is all washed. Um, you can see that almost all of the germs have been removed. So that's this little black guy. Um, a lot of those have just come right off. All of the skins have either dissolved or come right off. Um, and we now have a product um, that once again, I'll show you. Um, We have our washed corn here, and we have our cooking corn here, and then we have our raw corn here. Um, so you can kind of see the differences between the three. I've got my raw corn, which is obviously very tiny. Uh, we have our cooking corn that's still going through the process. You can see the little uh, base of the kernel is still attached there. And then we have our washed corn where much of those have been removed um, and we're left with, we, we still have some of them and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but most of it's been removed and of course the skin's all been removed. So the next thing we will do is actually start to grind this and then we're surprisingly like very close to making tacos once we've ground it. Um, anyone who's ever made tacos at home from Masseca or Masa Carina, uh, it's basically the dry version of what we're about to make. So it's a flour that we rehydrate into a dough. Um, it's obviously quite easy to work with as well, um, but this stuff's way easier to work with and, and although the lead up to this moment is a bit of work. It's a lot of passive work. It's not a lot of standing around the stoves being, you know, 
working hard in the kitchen. It's, it's passive kitchen work, but the results, I, I, I would honestly encourage you to do this. If you have any love for tortillas and tacos or arepes or a tor uh, tamales or any of those things, really getting one of these grinders and trying this whole process out is really a worthwhile experiment or a process to go through. The grinder we're about to use, you can get it at a lot of your local Latin stores. If they don't have one, they likely have a new batch showing up shortly and they're not very expensive and they're awesome. They work really well, very easy to use um, and just worth it. It creates an incredible product. So the next thing we're gonna do is grind. So Sydney is muscle and I'm not. So she's gonna do the grinding. I'm gonna rearrange the camera um, so that we can actually get it over to where we need it to be uh, to show you guys how this process works and just how easy it is. Um, so I'm going to kind of step off this camera for a second. Sid will stay on it. Um, and then, what, do we want to spin this? We do, right? Do you want to spin this so it's hanging over sure. there? Because then we can stay on camera a little better. Awesome. So, as you can see, we have this lovely grinder. Um, yes, this is pretty good on camera still. So it's just got a regular old hopper. Um, there's two plates here that are kind of controlled by this um, auger that goes through the middle that of course rotates the grains and pushes them through the process. You can adjust this grinder um, for thickness, but we basically do it as thin as we can get it to, to go before it's actually just shut on us. And uh, it's as simple as sort of loading it up and grinding the corn. So you want to stick a bowl underneath um is it, it was just, more space you good so then, yeah, cool. also we, when we're setting this up uh be careful if you're putting it on your counter so what we've done is put it on a wooden board and something heavy on top uh because you do need to use quite a bit of force and um in particular the one we have is um a little bottom heavy but can still move okay so i'm gonna start loading some corn up in to the hopper here Nick's going to be my backup just in case the cutting board moves on that. <laughs> Ideally, you've got like a table that you can attach this to or something like that, but it doesn't fit over my kitchen bar table. So we had to come up with this cutting board, cutting board contraption, um, but it works I, well. I have a question. If you don't have a grinder, like, is that really necessary? Or it's yeah. obviously it would help a great deal, but... Could you grind it with a rolling pin or mash it? Or is there another way to do that just in case? Yeah, you can use a food processor. Um, so like, you know, your regular sort of chopper chopper. Um, I think we should move this top heavy board. Um, that, that'll work. It's just a little bit arduous. So you have to go in very small batches when you do it that way. Um, so you can use a food processor will work. You can use, um, you can actually use a rolling pin and smash it like you suggested. You can use a molecate or a pestle and mortar um, to do it. It's just gonna take you a little longer to get to a smooth consistency. Um, and you can also use like a meat grinder or the grinder attachment of your, um, you know, KitchenAid food processor type thing. Um, but then you're gonna wanna grind it twice because it won't come through fine enough. So you're gonna wanna grind it twice and it can be quite difficult to grind it the second time. So I actually do recommend to people people to use something like anything like that the first time and they're going to struggle with it and they're probably going to hate the process of it but they're going to love the end results and then they'll love the end results enough to go buy one of these grinders they're really only like 30 to 50 bucks depending on where you find them um and they're quite it's quite exceptional if you look at how quickly um it's awkward the way this is sliding around I'm like, <laughs> for me it looks super easy if you look at how quickly that's making the dough um, it's awesome. And I can tell you from, I've struggled to use a food processor before with this and you do get okay results for sure, but it's, it's a struggle. Um, so yeah, I think experiment with whatever you can get it done with. And then when you fall in love with it, because you will invest in one of these machines and you can even share it with one of your foodie friends in the neighborhood. Or you can do this while we're doing a fun tequila school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We do, uh, we do a lot of tequila schools at the restaurant. Well, we used to do them at the restaurant and now we do them virtually um, online and uh, where we basically do an educational session on tequila uh, and drink tequila while we do it, but trying to get more and more people in love with that beautiful spirit uh, that is so steeped in history. So, 
So as you can see, this happens pretty quickly. Um, and we can probably stop there. I think that's enough for us to work with, right? Um, so Sydney's got a nice amount of dough there for us. Um, and I'm just gonna move this out of the way now. Um, and, and so this now is just simply that ground uh, tortilla, or I should say that ground nixtamalized corn. And you can see it already has the ability to sort of form a bit of dough. It's already got some structure to it that it wants to stick together. Um, and all we're gonna have to do now is hydrate it with a little bit more water. And we're gonna want to season it with um, some salt, of course. So like all foods, we wanna be seasoning them. So I'll throw in a bit of salt. And then Sydney is usually the boss of how hydrated it should be. So I'm gonna let Sydney get in there with her hands and start uh, mixing that up. In the meantime, I'm just gonna put this pan on some heat over here and we will soon be cooking some tortillas. So Sid's going to make sure that this has the right hydration. This is really just a, a feel thing. You've got to get to know what you're looking for in the dough. You basically want a dough that's going to come together and not have any cracks um, and not fall apart on you, but it's also not going to stick to your hands. It, it needs to be dry enough that it's not sticking to your hands, um, but pliable enough that it holds together as a dough. So you can see it's already starting to do that. Um, it will soak up a little more water than you think it will. So when it does feel like you've hit the right uh, texture on it, we generally want to let it sit for five or 10 minutes and then check it again and then add a little more liquid to it. Because like all um, grains and things, when we're hydrating them, they will absorb more and more as they sit. Um, much like polenta, if you've ever made polenta and added the corn, the corn meal too quickly, you end up with way too much because it just absorbs and absorbs and absorbs. So um, Sydney has that almost to exactly where we want it to be. I'm starting to warm up a cast iron pan. Uh, usually when we do this, we're using a, a wider, flatter cast iron pan, but the, for the purpose of this home demo, we're just using my um, regular old cast iron pan. That's as big as I can get. Uh, we are going to never really oil the tortillas, but we do want to make sure that our cast iron pan is well seasoned. So sort of between every other batch or so, uh, I will add a little bit more water to the, um, or water, oil to the thing, and then just kind of wipe it out. Um, but we don't want to be frying these doughs. We want to be dry toasting them, but we do need to keep it somewhat oiled. So um, I'm going to scramble and find my cooking oil, which of course I'm exceptionally low on and all I have is all the oil. <clears throat> so I have our tortilla dough here. So when we're just like, to give you kind of a sense of what we're looking at here. So this corn almost has like a slight um, sulfury smell. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, don't be alarmed. That's normal. Um, and then, so I made my dough here and it feels a little bit gritty. Um, but only as you're mixing. So as you add the water, it's gonna kind of hydrate and give kind of a texture like Play-Doh that has a little bit of sand. So again, this can change even as you're making tortillas. So if you need to, don't ever hesitate to add more water. If you try it and it's not working, add some more water. And one thing when I uh, make these, I always let set aside a little bit of the ground masa before we add water, just in case you need to adjust. Yeah, so if you do add too much water, like Sydney said, it's nice to have a little bit of that ground masa that we haven't mixed with anything yet to be able to feed it back into it. Otherwise, you're kind of stuck with the hydration you've done. Um, if you happen to have masa harina on hand, like the, the dried masa flour, you can always add some of that back into it, but that, that sort of defeats the whole purpose of everything we're trying to accomplish here. So um, we've got this beautiful corn. This is Ontario corn. Again, at Taco Farm being a feast on property, we're always looking for opportunities to stay within the confines of Ontario. Um, and we've accomplished that with this corn in this relationship. So it would be a real crime against culinary uh, triumphs to be adding that flour back into it. But to, to save dinner, I would do it, of course. So um, we have what looks like the perfect texture there. Um, so the next thing we'll do, as, as we mentioned, if we were doing these um, not for the sake of this demo, we would be allowing this to sit a little, little bit longer um, just to continue to soak up and to see that we've got that texture just right. Um, but it does look really good. So we're gonna move on. Um, so what we have then is the only other piece of specialized equipment that you may need 
Um, and if you don't have one of these, you can certainly do it with a lot of different ways. Um, you can, uh, you can uh, use, use, use yeah, use a rolling pin, use a cast iron pan, use two pans that fit together, whatever. You guys can all figure out ways to smush something quite effectively. Um, but again, if you're doing this on any sort of regular event, these things are very inexpensive and very useful and helpful to have around. Um, so we're going to use this and for the convenience of things, we're going to use a little bit of uh, parchment paper between layers just to be able to squish it down. So Sid will go ahead and do that. I've got my pan warming up. Um, the only thing to, to sort of watch as Sydney does this is that she's not squishing all in one movement. If you squish all in one movement, which is what I do, I'm like dumb, dumb like tractor, strong like ox. So I will try and solve it all with one foul push. Um, but as Sid's doing, you got to spin it, squish it, spin it, squish it, and do that two or three times. That way you get something that's nice and symmetrical um, and doesn't squish out like ob oblong um, shapes. I think you went a little hefty on that one. It's a, it's a thick one. It's a gordita. <laughs> it's a gordita. So what yeah. Sid's made accidentally here is a gordita, which is just a nice fat. They call me gordo sometimes because um, I'm husky, I'm thick. So she, she has made that in a tortilla version, which of course is a dish. Uh, gorditas are wonderful, um, but they're more about eating on their own with a little bit of salt, a little bit of lime juice. Um, they're not so much for tortillas like tacos, um, just because they're so hearty and so thick. So um, I'm going to save this. We're not going to throw it out because I will be eating that with some maple syrup later. You could also just put it back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> One of the beauties of working with corn versus uh, flour is that we're not continuing to work gluten into this. Corn doesn't develop gluten. Um, so we can play around with this and we can just put it right back. And it's literally like a child's Play-Doh. You can just keep playing with it. And there's no, when you're working with a pie dough, of course, you wanna be very quick with it, very deliberate um, to not over overwork that. So it's taken a couple of attempts to get the right one. Yeah, I squished it a little too hard. <clears throat> so, as soon as we have one ready to go, we will start to cook up a tortilla. Um, the, uh, we're going to keep our, our tacos very simple today. Um, we're just going to put a little bit of cheese in them. This is the, this is the experiment we did when we went out to the farm. Uh, you know, we really just wanted to do the tortillas, go through the process together. Um, but as chefs, we know we can't go anywhere without um, feeding people and sharing our gifts, which is, which is the gift of, of breaking bread and eating together. Um, so when we went to the farm, we brought a little bit of cheese just to showcase uh, the, the best parts of the tortilla. We didn't want to make things too complicated. Um, the cheese we're using today is queso Oaxaca and queso Menonita. Um, these both are produced by local Dairy Co., which is a dairy producer outside of Ingersoll. Uh, they have a subcategory of cheeses called La Vaquita, which are their Latin American cheeses. Um, and they do a wonderful job. They're, they're a beautiful family, Sikh family, opened a cheese shop, started making Latin American cheeses, have won gold medals for their Oaxaca. Um, and they're just an amazing group to work with. They actually source all their chili peppers and all kinds of stuff. And again, give us that opportunity to buy the Latin cheeses that we want, the Mexican cheeses that we want, but staying within that feast on mantra and world of, of supporting local and buying from Ontario. Um, so we will just be stuffing these tortillas with Oaxaca and Manolita. Do you have any ready to go? That one, it's not perfect. It's, but... not, it's not round. Um, I but, don't uh, think anyone at home that's making these at home that would be making these at home are going to be making them very perfect either. No, so this is sure. a good example. If and ever... it looks like so much fun to press that thing. I really want to do that. Yeah. If you've ever made crepes at home or anywhere, crepes, the first couple of crepes you make are for the chef right away. They're always messed up somehow. Um, and that's the same with these tortillas. It's, we always mess the first couple up um, before we're able to move on. So um, Sydney's getting into a bit of a rhythm there now. Um, and of course, she's gonna yell at me for using a utensil. So Sydney and Hilda, Hilda, our, our chef, sous chef at Taco Farm, who I had mentioned is from Mexico City, um, is teaching Sydney how to only use her fingers for this process and by sort of tamping down and spinning the tortilla as you cook it, um, you can achieve this puff situation where we'll end up with puffy tortillas. And I have yet to master that. I have ridiculously chubby fat fingers who don't have dexterity like Sydney um, and Hilda. So I'm not very good at it yet. 
although this one's giving me a little bit of love. So um, we're just I'm pushing down on it and sort of spinning it as I go to put sort of dimples in and cause that air to start to circulate within inside the tortilla as we build layers. Um, you guys can't smell this right now, but this is giving off the most intoxicating aroma. Um, and this is what tacos are all about. This is what tortillas are all about. And we make our tortillas at Taco Farm from scratch every single day. Um, we make every tortilla, every chip we make from Masa Harina, and we make it ourselves. But we rarely make it from the Masa like this, because this, of course, process is very arduous and long for a restaurant that serves as many tacos as we do. Um, but as we develop these, these loves for these tortillas, uh, it's getting harder and harder to stay in that world. Um, because once you've had a taco like this, there really is nothing quite like it. Um, and you will see why we only put cheese on them or only dip them in a little bit of hot sauce because uh, you really can't mask this beautiful flavor out much more than that. So this guy is almost good to go. Um, I'm gonna give this a taste just to see if we've cooked it through. Um, it's a little bit undercooked, so I would leave it for a few more seconds, but the richness, the sourness from this, um, the, the, there's this wonderful corn flavor, but it's also got this really deep, sour tanginess to it. Um, that of course doesn't compare to anything that you would eat in a commercial environment. These are, these are so good. Um, and I, I love them. I, I can't really communicate that to you guys enough unless I could share them with you. Um, but let's get a couple more in here. Are you going to do the gordita? No, this is another one. Okay. It's just, it's a big one. It's a biggie. Okay. And then we'll do a couple with cheese. And then and one of the funny things that happened when we went to the farm, um, we, the day before we had an event at uh, Langdon Hall, um, where we were part of a uh, feast on event, uh, feast on the farm. And we were serving out food at Langdon Hall with another local company, Wooden Boat Company, um, Thompson Tran, exceptional chef, and of course, Langdon Hall and Jason Bangeter. Um, and we uh, were challenged to make a dish and use Ontario ingredients. And we made our ta tacos with mushrooms and, and, or, um, and cheese. And we made a couple of beautiful hot sauces. One was uh, classic uh, salsa roja, which is just a bunch of chili peppers and garlic and tomatoes. And then we made a fermented pawpaw fruit salsa as well. So pawpaw fruit being um, a local indigenous fruit that sort of through the process of um, the way North America has changed and there are no more large mammals roaming the earth, moving these seeds around for us. The plant really isn't as prolific as it used to be, but of course there are some wonderful people who are making sure it remains and it comes back and thrives. So as chefs, we're able to work with these ingredients. If you've never had pawpaw fruit before, look for it. It's only available um, sort of in the black market. It doesn't show up in grocery stores very often. You need to find a forager friend or someone who's got a tree in their backyard. Um, but it's this fruit that's it's about this big, and it's essentially a tropical fruit flavor. It tastes somewhere between mango, banana, papaya, pineapple. It's got all these different flavors. Um, vanilla and the texture of custard. It's just lovely. Um, so we made this beautiful fermented salsa from it and at Langen Hall amongst this really lovely crowd of people, it went over very well and everyone loved it. So the next day we were working with farmers at Wish Sock to Winnewalk and uh, we brought that salsa and the salsa roja and the cheese and they loved it and they were very generous with their compliments towards us and it was very enjoyable. But Dave was like, hey, I wanna try it with just maple syrup. And we were kind of like, come on, just maple syrup? Um, he's like, well, this is my maple syrup and, and it's incredible. And I can just imagine that the tangy saltiness of these tortillas with that maple syrup is going to be exceptional. Um, and it was, it was absolutely incredible. And while we all love the salsa roa and the uh, papa fruit salsa, the real beautiful moment of the day was the maple syrup and just the way it brought everything full circle for all of us. Um, and, uh, you know, just gave us that moment of chefs to see through from start to finish the wood was from the sugar bush that the maple syrup was from. The farmer who grew this stuff for us was so passionate about it and wanted to share it with us. And, and we were nothing but genuine in how much we loved it because it really was amazing. So um, we are going to do it that way with you guys tonight with just a little bit of maple syrup. This is not a um, novelty bottle of maple syrup. This is not a prop or a TV prop. These are the actual jugs we go through. And our, our main business is in St. Jacobs, Ontario, which is just outside of Waterloo. Um, we have a lot of connections with our Mennonite community around us, 
And we move an awful lot of maple syrup through those restaurants, uh, through butter tarts and all kinds of beautiful things. So um, I stole this from our bakery today and uh, I'll be sure to bring it back. But it's some beautiful local amber syrup from this year's crops. Um, Sid has just put a little bit of cheese inside that tortilla. Um, like I said, that's queso Oaxaca and queso Menonita. Um, Oaxaca is a mozzarella style cheese. It's a, it's a hand stretched braided mozz. Um, eats very much like mozzarella. And Oaxaca is actually, oh, sorry, the queso Menonita or queso Chihuahua as it's called is from the Chihuahua region. It's actually from Mennonites who um, made their way down the entire Eastern seaboard until they got somewhere where they were welcome, which was in Mexico. Um, and they settled there and they were of course making their cheeses there. So it's a cheddar style cheese. Um, it's a little softer than your average cheddar, but it's got that nice salty flavor, um, a little bit of orange color due to the annatto seeds that they throw in it. So an indigenous ingredient to Mexico used to color the cheese um, in, in a non-traditional way that we see up here in North America. Um, and anyways, those two cheeses together, we use quite often at Taco Farm as a blend to give us the qualities of sort of stretchy mozzarella, um, but also salty sort of sharp cheddar cheese. So um, that's what we've got inside of our tortilla here. And that's all we're gonna put in it. So again, this, this tonight is about the tortilla. It's not about uh, making a taco. It's not about making something complicated. Uh, we just really wanna work with this corn and taste that corn in the process that we put it through. Um, and we find that that slightly salty, nice gooey cheese is the perfect sort of base for all those flavors to shine. And then of course, cheese and maple syrup. I don't know if it's just a Waterloo region thing, but uh, cheese and maple syrup, ap Dutch apple pie with a little slice of old cheddar cheese. I mean, these are the things that make my palate dance and uh, it re really works well together in this application. So yeah, so Sid's just cranking away on tortillas there. If we had a bigger pan, we'd have more going. This taco actually looks ready to eat. Um, doesn't it? It does. Doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> I'm going to get a plate. Uh -huh. So uh, I don't know if they've mentioned, but we're kind of on like a medium low heat. And so as we do our tortillas, as Hilda says, and has shown us, so we're taking the one that we just pressed, we're putting it down onto the pan. Okay, and we're gonna let that just sit there for a second. This one looks better. Right? This one was our thick guy, so we'll let him sit for a little bit. So the first flip here is gonna be uh, kind of a quick one. And then we're going to cook it on the other side a little bit longer. And then that's when we're going to kind of turn it and use those air bubbles um, to also just show us kind of when it's done as well, but also so you don't have such a dense tortilla. And I'm going to eat a taco. So the only other sauce we brought today is our chili seca, um, which is a cooked salsa, some dried chilies, some nice caramelized garlic that gets cooked in the oil and then emulsified out. So a really nice, rich garlic flavor to it um, and provides a nice sharp sort of kick to it. But I'm going straight maple syrup for this first one uh, because of my new friend, Dave. And it was just such an awesome revelation of how good this was together. And I wish you guys could taste these because they're quite incredible. I wish we could taste them too. Um, do you, would you do, would you consider doing um, sort of, um, you know, not lessons, but yeah, does, does any of your customers ask you, you know, you could do demonstrations and teaching people how to do it. Yeah, and uh, we do we do through our Fat Sparrow. So Fat Sparrow is our, our restaurant group. Uh, we have our own butcher shop, bakery, couple of restaurants, grocery store, all that kind of stuff. Um, we do on that website through that marketplace, we do virtual cooking classes, our virtual tequila schools that I mentioned earlier. Um, and yes, we did uh, birria tacos through our virtual cooking classes. We didn't do them through mixed and malized corn. Um, although Renee, I'll send you some free tickets to the next one because that's a fantastic idea and we will do them. Um, but yeah, we've had a lot of fun doing virtual cooking events right here in this room. Um, mm -hmm. With, with groups of people where we send out boxes of food for everything that they'll need and they cook along with us for a couple of hours. Um, and and it's, it, then it is lovely because especially in the earlier days of the pandemic, um, you know, chefs love cooking for people, but they also love cooking with people. We wanna see you guys 
we want to experience the food with you and go through all those motions with you. And that gave us a really good opportunity to do just that um, in a very large platform. It's really endless how far you can go with the online world. Um, and it was great. And, and even though we're somewhat back to normal and full capacity within the restaurants, we're continuing to do these cooking demos because uh, they just seem to have a place online. People enjoy the comfort of their own kitchens and the technology is there. Um, particularly with Tequila School, they work very well because everyone's in the safety of their home while we engage in sometimes five or six ounces of tequila. So um, yeah, absolutely, Renee, we do both those types of things. Um, so we've got just uh, a little more than 10 minutes left, but uh, if there's any questions from the audience, please jump in and ask and, um, um, and take it away, keep going. Awesome. So I'm just gonna keep eating, <laughs> but this, this carne or this chile seque is the second thing I'm trying the tortillas with. Um, again, it's just a straight hot sauce. And I think one of the things that we love about Mexican cuisine and, and certainly as we explore beautiful ingredients and it's been core to my philosophies of food all along was that you, you honor the ingredients, right? So by not overcomplicating this and just sort of enjoying an ingredient or two at a time is really great. Could you, um, could you um, deep fry those? Like cut the, could, could you make taco chips out of these? Exactly. Yes, that would be the next step. So at Taco Farm, we do make all our own chips. Um, in fact, we sell those coast to coast across Canada. Um, and that's exactly what the next step would be. We would, we would actually age the tortilla overnight. So we want to lose some of the hydration, get that tortilla a little drier. Um, so if you were making these, you would make them now. You would eat your tacos and enjoy them. And then you would allow those tortillas to slip into the fridge overnight. And then in that process, they'll lose some of their humidity and their moisture. And then they fry up just all that much better. So then you would simply deep fry them um, to become beautiful chips. If you're not into deep frying in your home, you can really easily just chop them into chips, toss them with a little bit of oil and bake them in the oven. Of course, they're not quite as magical as a deep fried chip, um, but they do work quite well. But the, the key to success is to age those tortillas at least one night. Um, if there's too much moisture in the dough or in the tortilla, when it hits the fryer, they'll absorb a bunch of oil throughout the cooking process just while that exchange is happening of, of moisture escaping. Um, so you do wanna age the tortillas at least one day overnight, um, and which is perfect, right? Because you're making them, you're enjoying them fresh tonight, and then whatever's left over becomes chips and you can you can enjoy those as chips. You can make chilaquiles, you can do all kinds of wonderful things with those, so. Another question, what proteins would be put in the taco along with the cheeses? So you could oh. put any, like these are just classic tortillas, so you could put, could you put anything in? You could literally put anything. Honestly, one of the best proteins is just beans, uh, like a nice refried beans, pinto beans. Um, and that harkens back to that, that original diet of that whole protein. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had some real magic with just beans. Of course, we're huge fans of pork in Waterloo County as well. Um, so carnitas comes to mind. Um, Sydney's locally famous for her birria tacos. So that's... Uh, beef shank that's stewed in a bunch of aromatic spices and yeah so delicious yeah really it's endless these are just tortillas for tacos so honestly whatever you like my only recommendation to folks is that at first keep it really simple honestly a little salt a little lime and you'd be surprised how amazing it is on its own a little maple syrup any of these finer things but um honestly anything you wanted fish tacos uh camarón shrimp tacos anything like that would be great how would you store uh, so if you had extra dough, let's say. Yeah, so um, we've read multiple things from different places, but, um, you know, the tried and true, just like if you had leftover pasta dough, you would just wrap it tightly in saran wrap and like, place it in the fridge. Um, also, just considering that if you do take it out of the fridge the next day, um, you might have to do some adjusting with your dough. So, you know, make a tortilla. If you find it's too dry, add some water. Uh, and that'll give you almost the same quality. Yeah, and the one thing you'll want to do too is um, allow the dough to warm back up. So you do have to put it in the fridge, otherwise it'll begin to ferment and, and get sour and totally change its makeup. But leftover dough tightly wrapped can go in the fridge or even the freezer. Um, but you will want to take that dough out and let it sit on the counter for a couple of hours just to get to room temperature. Um, and then it becomes easy to work with again. If you don't, you can work with it. It just gets a little crumbly and dry and you'll find yourself adding more water to it. Um, but honestly, you can freeze it fairly decently. 
Um, so yeah, some, sometimes we'll make a big batch of this, eat a quarter of it tonight and then freeze three more portions of it. Uh, but you do have to remember when you pull it out, allow it to warm up on the counter and then be prepared to have to work the dough a little bit before you get back to pressing tortillas. And then how long would it last in the fridge? The fridge, you'd really want to eat it within a few days. Um, the freezer, it would last for several weeks, two months. If you've wrapped it really well, you want to make sure that it's not drying out in the freezer. So um, fridge, fridge not as long because it's going to continue to sour um, and get tangier and tangier. And eventually, unless you were to add a little citric acid to it, um, it it'll start to get spots on it, which aren't very desirable. So um, freezer more than fridge. Otherwise, just eat them all in one sitting. Um, we are, we are going to start making these doughs on Saturdays and Sundays at Taco Farm and selling them for folks as raw dough so they can take home and make tortillas at home. Um, I know in, in any community that's rich with Latin American people, there's usually a store that does the very same thing that makes massa for folks to come in and buy, uh, fresh that's yet to go in the refrigerator. So it's absolutely perfect and ready to be used. So if you're lucky enough to live in a community with a, a wonderful Latin grocery store, you might want to ask them because they might do that for you. Ah, good point. Um, is there, are, I'm looking at questions, no more questions, but um, um, our next guest is coming on at 8.30. Is there anything, um, anything else you'd like to add? Who do make dessert, sort of fill it up with sweet, sort of, well, I mean, you've sort of done that with your maple syrup yeah. and your pawpaw you, relish. Yeah, the, well, the pawpaw salsa was quite spicy, it was savory, but you can, okay. you can do tamales with dolce de leche or chocolate. Um, yeah, you can certainly take this in a sweet direction. There's really, other than the salt component I put in there, there's nothing overly savory about the tortilla itself. It's tangy, it's rich with corn flavor, so it does lend itself really well to sweets. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, that this is us in a nutshell. I mean, we're we're chefs. We love exploring pathways and learning more about each other's cultures or cultures that we don't even belong to, in my case. Um, and, you know, at the Fat Sparrow Group, we're constantly trying to do everything right and from scratch and by hand. That's why we have butcher shops and bakeries and all of those things. And uh, Taco Farm is a really great example of, of that commitment to always doing things the right way and from scratch. And, you know, we've been around at Taco Farm for almost 10 years now, um, but we find ourselves revisiting the concept and just wondering if there's things we should be changing and approaches we should be doing differently because the ultimate pursuit is, is just moments like this and, and food that makes everybody, well, food that really schmecks, which you gotta be from Waterloo Region to know what that means, but uh, food that really schmecks is our ethos at the restaurant. And uh, yeah, this is a great example of it, so. I've never heard that term before. <laughs> well, I'll send you a link. There's a cookbook author. There's a cookbook author named. Uh, uh, oh my God! Why is her name escaping me? Edna Stabler. Edna Stabler, who was actually a travel writer, who was issued the assignment to come to Waterloo Region and do a story on Mennonite culture and Mennonite cuisine. And she did that. She came to the community. She embraced the community. She actually lived with a local Mennonite family, um, the folks that we get our apples from, believe it or not. And she just fell in love and she wrote a series of cookbooks. The first one being called Food That Really, Food that really Schmecks. Um, and it's just an exploration of Pennsylvania Dutch cooking and Mennonite cooking. Um, and she's a hilarious writer. She's passed. She's since passed. But um, she's at my culinary hero. She's a hilarious writer and her, her food ethos couldn't align more with ours and that's to do everything from scratch, cook from the heart, cook seasonally. Um, and Fat Sparrow was actually named after one of her recipe, uh, Fat Spatula, which is a drop donut recipe that it translates into Fat Sparrows. So we're named in, in her honor and uh, she's hilarious. She's a hoot. Her writing is, is a gift to all of us and her recipes are of course wonderful too. So if you ever see a copy of Food That Really Schmacks, you should pick it up. And the older it is, the better because it, it'll have jokes. You just made me um, think of something else which would be good in those, um, especially for gluten-free people, would be like apples, make sort of an apple pie totally. out of or a, an apple turnover with the corn around um, and the taco shell and a really nice sweet apple with the um, maple syrup. Totally, yeah, for sure. And on that gluten-free note, like, yes, we've had to use tortillas for an awful lot of desserts at Taco Farm because we make churros and that's our sort of only dessert we really 
make and well we make a couple more but we always make churros but of course the gluten-free folks can't have those so we do explore a lot of roots with tortilla chips um, and a tortilla chip and a little bit of dolce de leche is a lovely trick snack um, but yeah a little apple hand pies with tortillas is also wonderful so yeah mm. somebody else is saying um chocolate you could you, oh you did mention that you could um add chocolate to these too. Yeah, in fact, we do uh, Mexican drinking chocolate. Sydney actually made uh, Mexican drinking chocolate for our um, Day of the Dead menus that we ran last week. And uh, Mexican drinking chocolate, which of course is just a little thicker, a little richer, and has sort of spices and ground almond and things like that in it. Um, again, one of these guys rolled up and just dumped in there. Um, that's just magical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, this... I want to fancy over here. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much um, for you. your time and this very special cuisine and the history lesson and a lesson that we all need to appreciate more and understand. And, and um, thank you, uh, Nick, for encouraging us um, to be better allies and not be afraid. And there are no dumb questions. Remember that, right? Everybody can say there's no stupid questions. And um, when they're when they're given in in um, the right, you know, with the with the best intention. Exactly. And I appreciate you, Sydney, and thank you very much for your insights and your story. And um, to our audience, thank you very much for tuning in. And feel free to um, you know let us know, write your comments. We'll save the comments, and we learn from those as well. And if you've got any questions you know, uh, get a hold of these folks over at um, um, Taco Farm and um, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to sign you up for a course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we love helping people through cooking. So if you got any questions, find us on Instagram or email us and yeah, we love nothing more than sharing our food and our skills and our knowledge. So whenever we get the chance, we love to do so. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, you guys. And Thanks, we man. shall see you anon. <laughs>